Hello, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome back again to another Theotech podcast. And this time we are recording some blitzes. So just to refresh you guys, um, blitzes are when Chris and I basically just sit down and for the next 10 minutes just um, talk about not really random stuff, but kind of random stuff um, related to the main or the full length podcast later on this week. So um, throughout this week, we're just going to release um, these little short 10 minute uh, episodes where, uh, yeah, Chris and I just share our thoughts on a particular subject, which I have graciously written about 10 minutes ago. <laughs> Awesome. You're, you're we're already, winging this episode. We're, we are we're going hot and we're going in blind. All right. Oh, man. Okay. So um, so we talked about venture Calvinists or venture Calvinism a little bit last week, and we're going to continue that this week. So that's a little bit of hint um, in terms of what these blitzes might be. Uh, so one of the questions that I have is, uh, what is one of your more recent adventures? My more recent adventures? Yes. Most recently, I went to Orlando. Ooh. And that was as a mentor for uh, Five Weeks of Code, which is a pilot program that this organization called Wycliffe Associates is putting on. And it's kind of like Google's Summer of Code, or uh, basically it's a way to try to activate young people in college who are doing computer science degrees to use their gifts to build software that's going to help Bible translation. Hmm, I and, see. Yeah, I got to fly out there and, and interact with some of those folks. It was a lot of fun. Yo, I remember you telling me that. Um, so were you the only mentor or were there like other people? That there were other mentors that were invited on different weeks. So okay. I came at near the end of their program. Okay, cool. And uh, did you like, like w- what kind of mentoring did you do? Like, was it more technical? Was it more like business, entrepreneurship? It was definitely more technical. Technical. And so like a lot of these young people are, you know, they're in their stage in their careers where they're maybe finishing up with college or master's programs and uh, they're looking to the future, right? And so Mm -hmm. a lot of the questions that they had for me were more about like what was it like to work on Amazon and, Uh, you know, technical interviews and preparing for that. And um, But what I really loved about working with them was their heart. They really do want to see, they want more opportunities to use their technical gifts uh, for projects that are really intentionally designed to advance the gospel. And that's what was amazing. So I want to see more and more opportunities like that created for them. And Wycliffe Associates is trying to do that kind of thing, trying to create those opportunities for these kinds of students. And uh, they were working on an oral-to-oral translation system when I was there okay. on Android. Okay. Yeah. And cool. then, yeah. And then just sharing within the vision uh, for Theotech in, in general, like to get that mindset there, right? What if you began with God as your customer and work backwards? What if you took it seriously and empathized with what he cares about and your aim is to delight him, to create a delightful customer experience for God. What would that look like? That yeah. was really the other side of the mentorship. For sure. Did anyone actually approach you and ask like if there is openings within Theotech? Um, or, I'm just curious. I think that, I think that some of them did ask kind of more <laughs> about my company, like what what would it mean for yeah. the future. But I don't remember anyone outright saying like, "Hey, can I just work for you now?" I don't think there's anything like that. Do you have a job? But, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I think I would be like that in that position. I'd be like, yo, uh, I need a job. <laughs> um, so that, it, it makes sense that they would talk about like Amazon, like your experience there as well. Yeah. Um, did you feel like a, uh, did you view, did you feel like a venture Calvinist when you went out or did you kind of feel like, oh, I'm just a regular guy going to help people out? How's that different? How's a venture Calvinist not different than a regular guy? I don't know. Ah, ha, ha, ha. Ah, well, you got me. Yeah. <laughs> no, hey. I'm just kidding. I did, think you, that, did you feel like an adventure Calvinist? Adventure ah, Calvinist, yes. I was waiting all day to say that. Okay, <laughs> thanks for the pun. I think that uh, I went there because that's what I thought the Lord wanted me to do, and it fit with my own personal calling and mission. And so from that perspective, it was, you know, being a venture Calvinist in that sense. Was I doing? Was I taking any massive risk or anything? Not, not really. But it fit with the dream of seeing more and more believers thinking that way, right? And thinking about how they can take risks to advance the gospel with what God has gifted them in. And so, from that perspective, it fits with a mission. But it's—I don't even know if it really makes sense to apply that label. I think that most, any time a believer steps out in faith, uh, even in the small things or the big things, they're kind of doing what a venture Calvinist would do. Yeah. Well, I, I guess you did have. A- to sacrifice some time, right? And then Absolutely. And playing. yeah, and some people ask me, like, is this a good use for your time and stuff and yeah. all, all this things like that? But they, again, it, because it fit with the mission, 
Yeah, because I mean, you're still trying to grow your company, and like, you could use definitely use that time to like invest in other things. So the fact that you just like step out, and also like, you you'll never know like where these students may end up. Like some of them may um, end up in like Amazon, and like not really like directly affecting you or your ministry. So like, you're investing in people that may never ever return. Oh yeah, favors right. So, I think yeah, that's a good point that you make, and um. Because uh, that, I mean, the reason why I say this is because, like, uh, I grew up doing youth ministry, and I think one of the mentalities that uh, I have when I'm doing youth ministry is that I have to commit to the fact that some of these kids may never like repay me, and I'm totally fine with that. And actually, that's something that I encourage them to do, uh, which is to not focus so much on repaying me, but also to like uh, invest in the next generation. So when they become like my age or when they become older, like. Um, keep in mind that like they have the responsibility to invest in that next generation. So I encourage like my my students to not to think about you know paying back. But in terms of like a mentor, like mm. that's something that I keep in mind. So that's I don't know good. if you had that yeah. Idea. My mindset is actually that uh, whatever good one does, this will receive back from the Lord. And so whether you're helping the next generation or even older people or companies or whatever, like, you know, there's many people that you help and get nothing in return for. Yeah, for sure. I mean, I was helping this Wycliffe Associates and do I get any direct return? Not quite, not really. Yeah. Um, and they're an organization. They're not, they're not like the next generation. But right. uh, I think that the only thing that can keep me motivated to do this and to show this kindness is really God's promises mm-hmm. and his commandments to love one another, do unto others, do to have them do unto you. But he also says that whatever good one does, this you will receive back from God. Mm-hmm. And that's where faith comes in, right? And that's really what a venture Calvinist has to do. They have to step out in faith, believing that I'm not going to get rewarded. I'm not going to get repaid by other human beings. Mm-hmm. If I do, great. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's great. It's a bonus. But I'm fully expecting and believing by faith in God's promise that He will give a good return for everything that I do in Him and by faith. And mm-hmm. um, and that's that's really what requires faith. Yeah. Because I think that there's definitely a culture of trading favors. Like I help you, you help me, that kind of oh, thing. Yeah. Like that and that happens all the time. And there's nothing intrinsically wrong with it. But faith is going a step beyond, right? And Jesus mm-hmm. Himself says that, like you know, if you love those who love you, what do you gain? Mm-hmm. But if you love your enemies, then you've gained. Mm-hmm. Um, so, yeah. His mindset requires faith. Yeah, that was definitely out of the ordinary. Definitely not intuitive, I'd say, for sure. Oh yeah, I think our natural person is that we'll just help the people who help us out. Yeah. For, for a gain. Makes sense, logically. Yeah. But cool. Um, I I live a pretty boring life, so I don't have that many adventures on my end. <laughs> I just wanted to. Maybe I should blitz you. Oh, yeah. Uh, I, I set myself up for this, so. so. What's the... Let's see. Hmm. I, I, I'm going to answer this question. What, what adventure have I done recently? And uh, I, I'd say one adventure... That recently happened was uh, I went to a friend's wedding in Oakland, and actually that was the same. I think that was the same weekend that Chris was gone, um, so that mm. kind of worked out perfectly. But um, yeah, so this person was uh, our house housemate for a while. Uh, she was here for about two years, and then uh, she's now moving to Montreal with her uh, husband. And uh, yeah, um, but uh, to let you guys know, I'm going to four weddings this year. <laughs> I've never gone to this many weddings before. So, um, how that relates to venture Calvinist, uh, I don't know. <laughs> Chris, if there's a way to connect the two dots, that'd be pretty awesome. But I, this is that was like my answer to the question. Uh, I think you just answered the question. That's, yeah, I think that's perfectly fine. There's no, there's no other like deep intrinsic value. Yeah, that's something that you guys will have to um, come to grips with. Is that uh, Chris? When he talks, he speaks in multi-dimensional levels, and I then do. when I speak, oh. I just like I just say for what it is. So, I think that audiences <laughs> like that. They, I, don't, I don't know. I don't know if they like listening to whatever multi-dimensional space time continuum thing. I like, like that. Okay, good. I just I just wish that I can create it. Oh you know? well, we could make something about weddings. I think so. Yeah. Like you know, let's let's do an exercise right now. Okay. Okay. So let's start with weddings and like, what is it? What's it like for? The weddings to be connected to the gospel somehow. Chris, I'm doing homework right now. <laughs> yes, you are. No, no, that's good. Um, well, I think you know there's a lot of imagery in the Bible that talks about weddings. Like right? for example, Jesus being the groom, and then uh, you know the bride being the bride, or the church being the bride. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think a lot of times uh, in Scripture, like um, Jesus or you know God will. Make the analogy of like getting ready for a wedding. Mm. Uh, he does this a lot, uh, you know, with the ten virgins and also like you know, um, 
what's another one i can't remember but there's always that sense of getting ready absolutely yeah Yeah. and i think like um it's it's cool because okay going back to my story um we got to uh hang out with christy that's that's the bride's name um for you know two years before she got married and i think during that time like uh, it was really cool to just kind of see the evolution of her getting ready to that point of marriage. Mm-hmm. Um, and definitely, like, there's def- there's definitely ups and downs, and there's definitely, like, um, you know, times where, like, you're freaking out or doubting yourself or whatever. Uh, and there's a lot to, like, plan for a wedding. Oh, my gosh, there's so much to plan for a wedding. <laughs> and there's so much money. Why do you guys take my money? No, just kidding. Um, but, you know, like, in the end... Um, you're you're gonna be living with someone else for the rest of your life and that's like that's a huge thing and i understand like everything that goes into a wedding mm-hmm. but god damn <laughs> like that's it's expensive my sister's also getting married uh soon uh and by soon i mean like next month so like she's getting ready uh yeah so you're it's, stressed out for other reasons i'm not well i'm not stressed out i'm just looking at these people like oh my god like really <laughs> See, I feel like, you know, what I feel like is that uh, what probably, what I would take away from a wedding is the central experience ought to be in sense joy. That's true. Not so much the stress of the pre-wedding and all that kind of stuff like that. But it's interesting that you mentioned that because um, in a lot of ways, what we experience in our lives today uh, are that kind of stressful anxiety about whether or not it's really going to happen, mm-hmm. you know, getting everything ready. Are we like, you know, is everything in place? Are we going to make it? And uh, I can totally see how the gospel ties into that because in this life we have all these trials that we're going through in preparation for the great wedding feast. Mm -hmm. And the thing that really sustains you is the joy of that day Mm -hmm. that you believe is going to exceed all the suffering that you're going through right now and that will endure forever. Yeah, for sure. That's huge. That's huge. Like, you know, this is not a small matter. Um, And so although our earthly weddings, you know, are limited, anytime that they echo that future one, that God is setting up. So this is, I'm going to tie it to, you know, venture Calvinism now, like, right? Okay. Wedding planning is a business. Here we go, guys. Here we go. Wedding planning is a business, right? Wedding planners are paid really well. Wedding photographers are paid really well to capture the moment, to make it a magical experience, you know, all those kind of things for the bride and group and for all their guests, right? And uh, in a sense, you could ask the question of like, what would Earth's most God-centered wedding look like? Ooh. If God is the customer, what kind of wedding would he want? Interesting. If you had a wedding planning business, how would you go about making preparations for his son's wedding? Mm-hmm. He hired you. Oh, that's a really interesting question. What would question. you do? Right? And, uh, and so that kind of ties it into the bigger picture. And uh, in that sense, if you, could, if you could empathize with what he really values, and you could envision the way that he wants his wedding to be, mm-hmm. that gives you a lot of inspiration in the present day for how our weddings could reflect that future hope. Mm-hmm. Um, so... I throw that out there as a question. I'm not answering it. I'm not an expert in the wedding planning industry. Uh, but, you know, that's, that's applying that God-centered mindset. If God was your customer, how would you arrange the wedding? Yeah, for sure. That's, I mean, that's something to think about. Both, I mean, I'm single, so I don't have to think about this for a while. Actually, we're both single. <laughs> it can happen overnight. Yeah. <laughs>